there would be few exceptions. Almost everybody leads somebody. And then without exception, everybody is following someone. And I don't think I have to give, I don't think I have to illustrate that. I think pretty quickly, uh, illustrations of that for better and for worse come to our mind. God has a plan for leading. Proverbs 29, verse 2, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. And then go back to Psalm 2. God has a plan for leading. Psalm 2, verses 10 through 12. It says, Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. And then in, in Judges 5 and verse 2, you remember Barak, he would was not willing to lead unless Deborah would go with him. And so it was said the, the victory will be given to the hands of a woman. And so after God gave that victory, there was a, a victory song that, that they sang. And part of that is when leaders lead, bless the Lord. And so Barak had had a failure in leadership, uh, what it ought to have been. But when leaders lead, then that's a reason to, to thank God and to praise God for that. So, God has a plan for leading. I want us to look at a few very basic aspects of that this morning. Uh, leading, first of all, requires authority. Uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Authority may, all, may not always be legitimate, but, but leadership requires authority. And so, when we think about authority, then let's start at the top or, or the bottom, the foundation, if you want to just say it that way. And of course... Leadership and authority begins with God. In Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17, I don't know of any one verse that uh, emphasizes this in so many different ways. It says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. Can you think of any other verse? He's the God of gods, the King of, He's the, the Lord of lords, the great God, the mighty God, the awesome God. Uh, there, there is no authority without Him. It, it starts with Him, and as, as we say, it ends with Him as well. He's, he's the final authority in all things. And as Paul was talking about this subject, to, uh, to ironically, to the Romans, if you lived in Rome, you were going to be faced with the conflict of authority. And so uh, Paul wrote and reminded them, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except... From God, and on that basis, he gave them some other other instructions. So you could say the question could be, well, who gets their authority from God, or who who doesn't get their authority from God? If there is any true authority, then that is is directly tied to God. And so we could think of authority from every every level or aspect of that. The authority within a nation, who has authority to lead? Well, God has a plan for that, not necessarily a form of government, but God has plan, a plan for that. What about man, man's leadership over animals and over nature? Is that just because we're the most highly evolved and the most intelligent because we have the higher IQ than the, it's the survival and, and the rule of the fittest? No, we, we only have authority over the, the physical world because God has given that authority to man. And so it is with husbands and parents and leadership within the church, if there's authority, it's either because we have a book, chapter, and verse that says God has given authority into the hands of fill in the blank, or we have that, and that one has been given authority to appoint someone to do some work. Even our, uh, our founders uh, of our nation, they were vague, and they didn't identify the Creator other than just the, the word Creator. Uh, but that was included in the, the Declaration of Independence. They appealed to an authority that was higher than the British Crown, and the British Crown would claim, well, we, we have the authority from God. Uh, so while there was a, a conflict of interest in a variety of ways, at the least we could say uh, the leaders of those nations were pointing to an authority and recognizing there is an authority beyond man. 
Unfortunately, that is, is often lacking today. And in 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul describes the mindset in particular of, of which would lead to what he call, calls the, the falling away. But what he says here is not limited to one particular occasion of falling away. He describes some who, who opposes, or one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, that, that could happen to anyone who appoints themselves to some place of authority and either denies or rejects or ignores or just in any way falsely claims the source of their authority as being not from God or solely from themselves in one way or another. So how many examples of that could we, could we think of in the past and the present? Even on a national level, there are governments at times that, that just outright declare we are an atheist government. That's typical of communism. And so China is currently run that way, being ruled by the, the Chinese Communist Party. It's not just that they don't take a position on that. They outright say... Uh, that, that we, we reject reject God and then they attempt to regulate uh, religion. Uh, who, who would oppose man's leadership over nature? Well, we, we have that in our society, the one who it just ends up being the most extreme of that, the group called, called PETA. Uh, they, they would reject any man, any man-made or, or any authority of man over this physical earth and the things in it. And then often religious groups who teach uh, reincarnation would likewise say, well, all living creation is equal. Uh, if you have uh, all life is of the same nature, being from God. And so there, there is not the idea of, of authority over. Uh, I read in preparation for this uh, the following statement of a, of, a, of a lawyer of a university he said, the state needs to be the ultimate guarantor of a child's well-being. There's just no alternative to that. The reason that parent-child relationships exist is because the state confers legal parenthood. It's the state that is empowering parents to do anything with children. And so, why do parents have authority? To him, well, the government said so. He's wrong, but just the idea that when man, in the language of 2 Thessalonians 2... When man declares his authority, if a parent declares their authority over their children just because I said so, uh, not I don't mean in some particular area, but the reason for their authority is not because the parent said so or because they're older or bigger or wiser. It's because God said so. God is the one who gives parents their authority in the home. And so example after example we can find today of man ignoring the plan that, that God has for authority, when there is leadership, uh, the question has to be asked: Well, who who gave you this authority? Next, look at Hebrews chapter five. The other side of leadership is is followership. Someone has to be follow, following. Leading implies submission. You you can't have really a, a healthy and functioning leadership. You can have somebody walking around with with no one behind him, but for God's plan for leadership is that there is also submission. And we learn about that in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. When we read, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. There's more to this verse than maybe is obvious on the surface. Typically we would say, well, because he was a son then he learned obedience. That's what our children are learning. Because they are a child, because they are a son, because of that role, then they are learning obedience. But that's not what this says, is it? This says, though, in spite of the fact that he was a son, he learned obedience. Why would it be the opposite? Because here, the role of being a son is not being, or being a son is not emphasizing his role Intensified emphasizing his nature, his deity. So even though he was equal to the Father in his nature, even though he was God, even though he was deity, 
as much as the Father was deity, yet he willfully submitted himself. And that, that, that brings a whole, uh, whole new angle to that. For Jesus to be called the Son of God implies his willful submission. And it's, it's no surprise to us that God would be the best example to us of leadership. That, that's easy. It, it is amazing, though, to think about God is our greatest example of submission. When I read Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 that we read a few minutes ago, submission doesn't jump out at you there. But in Jesus' coming, and in Jesus being described as He is here a son and learning obedience, God is our model of submission. And so that message, of course, is scattered throughout the New Testament, even to Christians in, in, a, in times of suffering. And that's the context of the entire book of 1 Peter. And so when he says in 1 Peter 2, 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. And then in verse 18, Servants be submissive to your masters. And in chapter 3, verse 1, Wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands. The, the context of that is, you can't trust your leaders right now. The government was persecuting them. Their masters were often persecuting them. Some of the, the wives, even their husbands, were persecuting them. Well, how do you submit to someone you can't trust? It's not easy. And the point he's making is, well, you may not be able to trust that leader, but you're learning to trust your Father in heaven. You trust God, and that's your basis of submission, not the conduct of the one that you visibly submit to. And of course, just as authority has been abused and corrupted, so also submission has. It's sometimes redefined as something degrading, when in fact it is the opposite. It's also often exaggerated by those who are seeking to, to gain unauthorized control. And so forced submission, and you could, again, think of that uh, in, in civil government. We can think of that in, in the home. We can think of that in, in, in the workplace. Can you think of any place where forced submission as a, as a general rule is productive? Even, even in animals, typically, there's a matter of training that, that is able to take place. Forced submission, especially by, by man's hands, uh, is, is typically a corruption of God's plan for leadership and the submission that it implies. So think about the different examples uh, of leadership. And in each one, I'm not going to take the time to uh, go into great detail with each one, but just consider with each leader what leadership requires of the one and what it offers to the leader and then what it offers to those who follow, who are willing to, to submit. And so with God, what does leadership require of God? Uh, every, Every trait of God is, is evident in the way that He leads. And what does God's leadership offer Him? Does God, God get some, uh, any, any need met by creating creatures to submit to Him? He doesn't get anything that He needs from those who submit to Him. Uh, he, he does desire the loyalty of those uh, whom, whom He has made. So sometimes He gets what He wants but typically, as far as man goes, typically does not get, does not, God does not typically get what he wants from man. But what about those whom he leads? What's the benefit of submitting to God? That's where the greatest wants and needs are met. In, in thinking about the leadership of, of those in the government, what does it require of someone to follow, to, to lead in a, a civil or social uh, relationship? And what does it require of them? And what's offered to someone who would, would lead in that capacity? Romans 13 verse 4 says that the civil leaders are God's minister to you for good. A, a civil or political leader doesn't have to be the enemy of God, obviously. It's not an inherently antagonistic position or work. Someone could do that work as a, a president, a senator, representative, uh, a mayor, or any position and say, I'm doing this, according to Romans 13, 4, to be a minister of God, a servant of God for good. 
And then also, he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister uh, to, to give judgment and to render wrath on those who do evil. So what does God offer to men who are willing to be leaders in the political or civil realm? Well, he offers them an opportunity to serve him, to be faithful to him, to protect and to provide for those who do what is good and to punish those who do evil. That, that's not an empty or val- valueless work. We could think of those who lead in the business realm, business being very broad, whether it be a shepherd, a tent maker, a CEO, a manager, however we would define that. What, what's required of someone to lead in that realm of life? And then think about what does that supply, what does that provide to the one who leads? And then what can they provide and what is God offering to those who would, would submit to them and work under them? See, God has a plan here for perfect harmony and something that that benefits everybody involved. In the home, whether it be the husband leading the family, the father leading his children, the mother in her realm, in her work, she's a leader. She's leading the children without doubt. And then often throughout the Bible, there are women who are over a household, like the woman of Proverbs 31 uh, or Lydia in Acts chapter 16. And so again, what in all of these, just, just kind of priming our pump to think about some different applications without trying to go into detail in all of them tonight, but what, is, what does it require for someone in the home to be a leader? What does it require of them? And then what does it offer to them? And what does it offer to those who follow them? The fact is, out of these, if you had to pick, if you could could only be one of these leaders in human terms of the government or a business or a home, where where are you going to be? Where where will you have the greatest impact and influence? What's the greatest position of leadership you could have? It's in the home, isn't it? That requires the most, uh, it requires the most of you, and it offers the most to you, and it offers the most to those who follow you, when, when the home, there's so much that is lost. Uh, when the concept of, of leadership and submission in the home is, is neglected as it is today. And then within the church, uh, there are primarily the leaders of those who are the work of, do the work of pastors, of elders, in a different sense, evangelists and teachers. And then as, as men work together, there's leadership in all of those areas. So again, just pick one in your mind to think of some application. What is required of them? And what is offered to them? And what, how do those who follow them benefit? And just pick any one of those and you give some thought to it and you see how beautiful and how simple of a plan God has for everyone to benefit by leadership. And today, of course, there are a few who, who work to preserve God's plan for leadership and all of those things, both God's ideas and then the practice of those. But those are just going to be few. The majority of people are going to be working contrary to God's plan for leadership in every one of these areas, and there's going to be consequences to that. As, as we read earlier in Proverbs 29 and in Psalm 2, it's, it's always worth looking ahead and thinking about, based on the views of leadership today, what's going to be the views of the leadership of the next generation? Now, if men will look to God, then the view will continue and there will be no change. But without God's help, then the next generation is typically, typically going to be responding to the previous generation. They're either going to imitate them because they, they believe the way the previous generation did it was good and right and wise and helpful, so they'll try to maintain it and preserve it. Or they'll re- react against it, either going to one extreme or the other extreme. And you, you, you don't, uh, just by, going, by overreacting to a, a wrong direction doesn't get you going in the right direction, does it? But think about in in the future, what's going to be the response to leadership based on the present leadership in any of these areas? 
think of those uh, of those then I intended to copy this to the the next chart and have all of these but think about these or if you're taking notes jot jot these down God government business home and the church or just pick one of these that maybe is uh, most applicable to you or helpful to you or in your mind in some way because turn to John chapter 10 next I want to look at some some principles uh, of leadership just by basically looking at look at few verses in John 10 and John 13 and then Psalm 23. In these three passages, we have examples of, of, of models of leadership. And, and so it's worth asking, uh, is, as we read about leadership in these verses, asking ourselves, is this my model of leadership? And then it's also worth asking, do I follow, do I respond to leadership in others in the right way. So in fact, I'll, I'll just leave this chart up. Uh, in, in John chapter 10, where Jesus presents himself as the kind of leader that is a good shepherd, read with me, first of all, verse 3. John 10, verse 3. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. What does this verse say about leadership? Well, first of all, his sheep hear his voice, uh, not just that the sound reaches their ears, but it's the, it's the idea they recognize and they trust. They don't hide. They don't run away like Adam and Eve did. Uh, they, they don't make an excuse. The, the sheep respond to the voice, the familiarity and the trust that the good shepherd has. He calls them by name. What, what's that telling? What principle of leadership is there in that He calls them by name? Well, yes, he, He's leading a flock. He's leading a group. But every individual part of that group He's interested in and, and knows well enough to know their name. And then it says that He, he leads them out. He leads them out of the sheepfold is the idea. And so there's, there's a time for sheep to stay. And there's a time for sheep to go. And the good shepherd knows when it's time for one and when it's time for that to end and when it's time for the other, when it's time to go and where to go. The, the good shepherd understands that and then puts that into practice. In verse 10, begins by talking about the thief who comes to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. What's, what's the motive of leading? What's someone's purpose for leadership? There's a whole, whole spectrum of that. But of the good shepherd, the good leader, uh, there, as we reflected on earlier, what does this offer? Anyone who's in the position of leadership, it, it offers something to them. But that isn't their only or their, their primary motivation for leading. They're leading for the benefit of those whom they lead. And in, in Jesus' work, as He said, I, I've come to lead them, to lead them to life, and to have abundant life. It's both the, the journey and the destination is life and having it abundantly. There, there's a principle there for the motive of leadership. And then verse 11, the devotion of a leader. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Again, just look over that list. Pick out one. A good leader is willing to give his life for those whom he leads. That's the nature of the commitment of, of true leadership. And then one more verse here in verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. Ties into what we read earlier, but that leadership has to involve a relationship. It goes both ways. Though some are leading and some are submitting, they both recognize the other and, and are known to the other. It isn't just one way. It isn't that, oh, well, he's at the top of the food chain, so uh, of course he gets all the, the attention and the reward. Well, there's attention that comes from those who are being led toward the one who is leading, but the one who is leading uh, recognizes the individual value 
of, of each individual one who is led. And so that even maybe leads our mind to the parable of, uh, of, of the one sheep who was lost. He goes out to find the one because he's not just leading a flock. He's leading a flock, but he's leading a flock composed of 100 individual sheep who are valuable to the good shepherd. Next, go over to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, many times by many people in many different ways, this has been used as an example of one of the principles of leadership. John 13, begin verses 4 and 5. Of Jesus, that he rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? One thing to notice here that, that is pointed out, I believe, in verses 3 or 4. Jesus could have waited until Judas was gone before he did this, but he didn't. Jesus washed the feet of Judas just moments before Judas was going to go out and betray him and they would be reunited in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knew that, but Jesus waited, or, or Jesus uh, did not delay washing their feet. Uh, he did that while Judas was there. Any, any principles of leadership in that that we could apply to these? In verses 7 and 8, so as Peter says, Are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash my feet, you have no part with me. This, this is another aspect of Jesus' leadership, that not only was he willing to serve, Jesus understood the value of being served. And in this case, not of him being served. Jesus knew it was important for Peter to be served, for James to be served, for John to be served, there is a benefit to being served. Now, not, not when it's in a selfish way, that I, I demand everybody serve me and, and your world has to revolve around me. I don't mean that. Uh, there are some people who have no trouble serving others, but they don't do well when they are the ones to be served. And there are others who are willing to be served and they don't want to serve. So everybody has different strengths or weaknesses and... For different people, sometimes one or the other is a challenge. Jesus knew that Peter, along with the others, uh, they needed to learn to lead, and they needed to learn to serve. But Jesus here also knew the value for them of being served. And so he ensured that they got what they needed. And then in verses 13 through 17... Or before I move on, then again, just apply that to one of these or any of these. The value of serving, but also there, there is a value to the willingness to accept being served. And it isn't humble to refuse to be served. Jesus taught that here. Okay, now verses 13 through 17. Jesus said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for I am. If I then, Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I don't know where it originated, but we've probably all heard the saying, well, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. Well, maybe we know what people mean, but that, that's not the method of Jesus. Uh, he, he showed them one, and then he gave them one. Jesus 
told them the things that he did, and Jesus did the things that he told them. Any applications we could make of benefit for leaders in any of these realms? And then last, go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, I'm just going to read it in its entirety. And even though I don't have those still listed on the chart, think of God and government and business and the home and the church and leadership, or maybe if there's some other realm that you can think of. As I read Psalm 23, think of what this teaches us about leadership that would go beyond even the shepherd or even specifically of God's leadership, which is, of course, emphasized here. But this is a model of leadership for us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So think of the aspects of leadership. Knowing who the leader is, that's important. I am not my shepherd. The sheep are not the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And here's what a shepherd does. He knows where to lead them to lay down. He leads... He restores. Uh, He is with them. Though I go through the valley, you are with me. You comfort me. You prepare what I need. You anoint my head with oil. And then, even though it's your house, and you're the leader, you'll let me dwell in your house forever. So again, going back to that list, you, you pick one. Have you ever had a leader... Of course, I know God is, but have you ever had a leader in a business setting? Can you think of a leader in, in some, some government role? Can you think of a leader in the home? Can you think of, of leadership uh, that you have observed in, in the church? And that this, this describes the kind of leadership that, that they were, that they offered to you. That's a part, uh, a part of the application in and benefit of the 23rd Psalm. And then the more challenging is, do you lead this way? As I said in the beginning, with rare exception, almost everybody leads someone. Do do you lead this way? Would that be the assessment of those whom you lead? Because surely there there is not another way to lead. This is not, well, just one form of leadership. There's no other plan or framework or principle of, of equally valid leadership, and there certainly is no superior plan of leadership. Uh, this is God's plan for leadership. Leadership, like everything else that's in the nature of this life, it's God's idea, it's not man's idea. Many people view leadership that way, that, well, this is just man's way to acquire power to get what he wants. They abuse it. But that's not why God gave leadership. He has a plan for it, for those who lead, for those who follow. And leadership has to constantly be on our mind because uh, leaders die. Leaders are constantly dying. And future leaders are constantly learning. Part of being in God's image is not only that we can lead, but we can look to the, the great leader and we can learn how to be better leaders. As we sing number 347, ask yourself, uh, who do you lead? Who do you lead? And if they follow you, where will that lead them? And as we sing, ask yourself, who do you follow? And where are they leading you? If you know in your heart and soul and mind and 
you know your strength and it's not been used to serve the Lord, but you're ready today to do that, then we urge you to respond to the Good Shepherd who gave His life for you. If you need to confess your faith with repentance in your heart and, and to be baptized in the blood of Christ, the blood of the, of the Shepherd will make you clean and you can follow Him. If as a Christian you need to return to the shepherd and to the sheepfold, and our prayers will strengthen and encourage you. Tell us how we could serve you as we stand and sing.